In this series, lowimpact.org and the Open Credit Network talks with people working to build a mutually owned, democratic, decentralised economy that builds community and doesn't destroy nature. We want to increase collaboration to bring about system change. Find links to the sites mentioned in the videos in the description below. Join the conversation by liking, commenting and subscribing to our channel. Hi, so today I'm talking with Brian Cech, who uh, of the Centre for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. Is that right, Brian? Yes. Hi, Hello. Dave. Hi. Um, Whereabouts are you in the States? Arlington, Virginia. So in the Washington, D.C. metro. Right. So it seems strange to talk about stabilizing the, the global economy now during the coronavirus crisis when the global economy is going to go into recession and... Um, but all governments are chomping at the bit to get back to growth. And you don't think they should, do you? No. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, the economy is in recession right now. Uh, it's been so for a while. And, yeah, that is a really crucial question. So what do we do at the end, of, or at least after the worst of the pandemic is behind us? You know, what, what are the goals then for the economy? And you're right, a lot of governments and of course the private sector in general really wants to go back to the old uh, uh, everything for growth. <laughs> I was yeah. gonna say, put it in other terms, but yeah, you know, the obsession with GDP growth and no, we feel that, that that's one of the things that got us into limits to growth predicaments to begin with. And COVID-19, it's a very nuanced example of that, but it is an example. And what do you do? What's your role exactly? And uh, what's the role of, of do, you, do you pronounce it Cassie for short? Cassie, we pronounce Cassie. it. Cassie. Yeah, so I'm the executive director and I established Cassie in 2003. And for a long time, I had kind of a loose oversight as the president of the board. Uh, but then I quit the federal government in 2017 to run Cassie full time. And I, I should maybe add that I started Cassie because uh, I had gag orders by my agency, which was the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They prohibited me from even mentioning the conflict between economic growth and biodiversity conservation. Right. So you decided to leave that job altogether and to sort of focus on the real source of the problem. Yes, exactly. And how, how, did you, how did you get into it? How did you sort of come together with other people and set up Cassie in the first place? Well, I got into it no later than my PhD research in the mid to late 1990s because uh, my, my research was a policy analysis of the Endangered Species Act. And as part of that, I was looking at the causes of species endangerment in the United States. So I had this big long database of all of the federally listed species and I had 18 categories of the reasons for their demise. And at the end of the day, it just struck me that, that this list of causes, it's like a who's who of the American economy. And at the same time, there was all this political rhetoric at the highest levels of politics, this rhetoric that there is no conflict between growing the economy and protecting the environment drove me nuts. Mm. So I got, I really invested a lot in studying conventional economic growth theory uh, and then the nascent field of ecological economics, ecological macroeconomics in particular. And yeah, that's where it started. How did you come to the conclusion that it was impossible to protect the environment um, and stop ecological damage as long as we continue to have economic growth? How did you, how did you get there? through a very deep dive into the nature of technological progress, because everybody out there agrees that there's a, a basic trade-off between growing the economy that, you know, we should, we should remind everybody out there what economic growth is. It's increasing production and consumption of goods and services in the aggregate. So it's population times per capita consumption measured by GDP. Yeah. And everybody agrees there's a basic trade-off between GDP growth and environmental protection, starting with biodiversity conservation. That's the most obvious uh, case. 
But then some people think, well, with new technology and getting more efficient, more circular, and so on, we can reconcile that conflict. And so I had to take a very close look at that. I did that for years, and uh, I, I published several papers, and, uh, and it's also in my book, Supply Shock, 2013 book, Supply Shock. But basically, technological progress, it's not matter from heaven. It comes from heavy investment in R&D, research and development, based upon current levels of technology. That's the part that the missing piece of the puzzle when you hear all this talk about, uh, oh, we can solve that. You can uh, address microeconomic or microecological scenarios, but in the aggregate, you're always placing more and more pressure on the environment, on the ecosystems in order to generate the money to invest in research and development to begin with. So it's, it's a negative sum game. Mm. You're losing biodiversity every step of the way. Very people, systematic. People often say to me, well, it depends on what kind of economic growth. But apart from increasing GDP, is there any other kind? I mean, I've, I've had to use the term GDP growth now because it makes it really clear. If I use just growth or even economic growth, people think I mean that there can't be any kind of growth, artistic or intellectual or emotional or spiritual. But of course they can. How do you introduce the concept? Thank you so much for putting it in those clear terms. And that's exactly why I decided to backpedal there for just a moment and remind our audience exactly what economic growth is. Because, yeah, it's, it's not like magic dust or uh, anything that, that's at all immaterial. It is increasing production and consumption of goods and services in the aggregate. So these notions of uh, green growth or dematerializing GDP, that's just what they are notions. They're not founded in any uh, scientific uh, assessment uh, or any solid scientific theory or evidence. And in fact, they're very much opposed to basic laws of physics and all the empirical evidence. What, what, what argument would you use um, to sort of sh to, to show that uh, increase in GDP can never be immaterial? Because I've had this argument so many times. They say, oh, well, there are sectors of the economy uh, like industrial patents or, or, or there are plenty of uh, sectors of the economy which don't require any material growth. And, I, and first of all, I say, well, they don't require desks or computers or electricity or suits or cars. They don't require any of that. Uh, which, which, which sector of the economy doesn't require any of that? And also, if, if the sector grows, uh, then the salaries and the wages in that sector will grow. And then how do you stop those things being, how do you, how do you stop that increase in, in wages and salary being spent on material things? There's nothing. Exactly. There's nothing at all to stop them being spent on material things. So, how, right. do you, so how do you persuade people that immaterial GDP growth is impossible? Well, we have to remind people once again what economic growth is. It's not a sector here or a sector there. It's not the patents. It's not the information. So it's increasing production and consumption of goods and services in the aggregate. Mm -hmm. So then we take a look at well what is that role of the patents and the information and the research and development and first of all you're right none of that is dematerialized to begin with they have to have the research equipment and so on but uh furthermore what is the new information going to help with what's it going to be used for and if it is to contribute to gdp growth well what it's used for then is the service of all those other very material goods and service production sectors. Otherwise, it wouldn't be relevant to GDP. So that's the that's a, a total refutation of this notion of yeah. materializing. I, 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 feel, I feel people just close down, they shut off, because um, the concept of not having perpetual economic growth is so alien to them, they, they, and they just can't, they put a barrier up and they can't hear it. And I'm, I find it very difficult to get through that barrier. Do you experience that? Absolutely. I, I think you just touched on maybe the biggest problem of all that we face. It's uh, 
this is such a huge issue in terms of all of the policy buttons and levers that it affects and in terms of the the degree to which a paradigm must be shifted uh, in terms of the very uh, material investments of the masses out there in stock in the stock market for example and so yeah it's a really really daunting task but i i know we're making progress i mean we have more uh, signatories every day we have more invitations for podcasts you know we have uh, and in europe you have a, a degrowth movement that's sort of in parallel with our steady state economics movement we we've been using the phrase lately degrowth toward a steady state economy because we kind of we all agree that this economy is too big it's unsustainable when I say we all, I mean steady staters and degrowthers. Mm, clever people. <laughs> yeah, the longer it takes to, to realize that uh, for the majority out there that then affects and affects public policy, the longer that takes, the more degrowth will actually be required to get back down to a sustainable level for a, a long-term steady state economy. And what, what successes have you had? How have you influenced policy at all? Or you know, how would you measure any kind of successes that you've had? Well, one very uh, concrete way, at least in terms of the public paradigm out there, is our position on economic growth. Uh, it's a position that very clearly identifies the fundamental conflict between economic growth and other things, starting with environmental protection but including uh, you know, economic sustainability and long-term jobs and national security and international stability. So we have this position and it concludes in calling for a steady state economy starting in wealthy countries, as well as what we call steady statesmanship in international diplomacy. We have uh, very close to 15,000 signatures on that now. And we found that when we, excuse me, when we, place that stack of signatures on the desk of a politician or a, a higher level economic advisor, that does get their attention. You know, it's not a few dozen signatures, it's not a few hundred, and, and it's rapidly increasing. So uh, that is one way that we've been able to empower politicians to start telling it like it is, that yes, there is a limit. If you, I, I'll tell you, just today, we saw an article in the Washington Post by a long time uh, growth obsessor, I would say, Samuelson, uh, Robert Samuelson, the journalist of Washington Post, a very neoclassically economics oriented uh, fellow. And he has hardly ever even acknowledged limits to growth. And we've been on him about that for years now. He finally is starting to acknowledge that. That's going to help a lot when the journalists start to acknowledge, yes, there, there is a conflict between this constant push for GDP growth and all these other things like public health. That's really encouraging, though. I mean, I, I would have imagined you, you would have been rebuffed by politicians and mainstream journalists. Well, we've been rebuffed many times, but you, you were asking about, you know, what kind of progress there's been. The ratio of rebuffing to acceptance is decreasing. Fantastic. Less rebuffing, more accepting. So the, the early economists, you, uh, Ricardo and Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, they didn't intend for the global economy to grow forever, did they? Well, that's very true, yeah. And that is, that's a, a key point that we like to make. The classical economists in general, they got it. They understood about limits to growth. They had, they had bigger picture, longer term thinking than most of our Chicago school neoclassically trained yeah, whether, you know, pure yeah. neoclassical or Keynesian. What went wrong? Where did the economics discipline sort of go wrong? Well, that's such a long story. And, you know, I devoted three chapters of my book, Supply Shock, to the academic development of thought on economic growth. And I think that there, there have been episodes of corruption in the development of economics, just like there have been many uh, areas in academia where big money was at stake. Uh, so one of the ways this manifested 
was in the loss of land from the production function. And so now when you open a, a basic textbook in economics, you're gonna read that production is a function of capital and labor. Yeah, and it's like an iconic formula for the economics discipline. And when you think about it and, and you build your, your concept of the macro economy around, well, naturally you forget all about land. Whereas Adam Smith and uh, you know, John Stuart Mill, of course, all the way up to Alfred Marshall and some beyond it really emphasize land as a factor of production. It was land, labor, and capital, not just capital and labor. Yeah. How, what, what do you say um, to people who say that without growth, we're, we're condemning poor countries to poverty? I say that with growth, we are condemning poor countries to longer term poverty and we're, and uh, worse naders of economic and environmental conditions. It's, the gre it's been the greedy push and in a lot of uh, ways also an ignorant push because there hadn't been the need for deep dives into ecological macroeconomics for a lot of these mm. So some of it's just pure ignorance, a lot of it's greed. The push for GDP growth among corporations and wealthy countries that have extracted resources from developing countries and, and um, put them into long-term scenarios of frankly, a lot of misery. But the more we push for that GDP growth, the worse those futures become for now. We also, we also get, um, oh, don't worry, human desires have limits, so we'll be okay. The economy will naturally stabilize because there's a limit to how much people want. And I just think, are you joking? Are you serious? If you get, you know, young, young men who suddenly become professional footballers, you know, in the, after the first year, they've got about 20 cars and, and it's just, there doesn't seem to be any limits. Right. I totally agree with that. That's a, that's nonsense. This idea that a natural limit to the amount of consumption will save things in any way. That's, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But there, I, there really have to be uh, democratic uh, based policies that come from social mores, including a conservation ethic. We need to return. What happened to conservation? You know, I'll tell you one of my pet peeves is that, the, especially in the US, the so called conservatives, they stole our word conserve. They stole it and they've corrupted it to mean the opposite of conserve. It's like, mm -hmm liquidating all of the natural capital as fast as possible to grow the, the bank accounts and the stock market. Mm. So, I mean, so we, we need to stabilize the global economy. Obviously it's not all, it's not about just individual countries, but in a world of separate countries, all of which are attempting to maximize growth in direct competition with each other. Um, and if they really lose that competition, they, they, they run the risk of ultimately, being invaded, you know, ultimately competition leads to war. And especially in a world of shrinking resources, there's a risk of war. So all countries want to stay, get their economy as big as possible to have the biggest military machine as possible. How do you, how do you get around that? How do you persuade an individual country to, to stabilize its economy in, in those circumstances? Well, earlier I mentioned our concept of steady statesmanship in international diplomacy. And that, that is the type of diplomacy that addresses this problem you just described. Uh, we need a convention on economic sustainability where nations hammer out, first of all, what the limits to growth are on earth, and then on a country or country basis too, and then work toward these be very difficult, obviously, agreements that have to be hammered out for essentially stabilizing the sizes of economies. But clearly, it should be clear enough uh, within the next, I mean, it's plenty clear now in ecological macroeconomics, but it should be clear to the world, to the populations and political leadership that, that, uh, there ha that this has to start in the wealthy countries mm. that have the means, that have the conditions to say, hey, that's, that's plenty of GDP per capita. Our population will stabilize now. 
it's relatively stable already. So let's settle for the in now for a long-term goal of a steady state economy. And with any surplus, let's help other countries. Let's give them a, a, a boost. We're not, not so that they can invest more in their military, but so that they can get to a point where they're ready to establish a steady state. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's got to happen in the, the rich countries first. And it's, it's a waste of time talking to Tanzania or Malawi and telling them that they have to sh- degrow and shrink Dave, their economy. Or It has to Dave, happen in the rich countries first. Well... Yes and no. I, I want to, I guess you could say, put in, not that you're, you know, denigrating Tanzania or Malawi, but I think they have a really important role to play. The, the prime minister of Bhutan, now he's the president of Bhutan, I believe, because they transitioned to democratic system. But uh, I mean, he, now he's the prime minister. He was the king of Bhutan. Remember, they underwent that transition uh, to uh, striving for gross national happiness. That's right, they're a different index in there. The prime minister is a rock star in international diplomacy. He, mm. he was a rock star for five solid years. And, uh, and more recently, the prime minister of New Zealand uh, has announced that they're, they are, they are abandoning this push for GDP growth and focused on well-being. Tanzania, Malawi, uh, Uganda, we're working a little bit with Uganda. We're trying to get, you know, all the way. Uh, the symbolism of it is tremendous. If a, a relatively poverty-stricken country is the one to provide the leadership or steady statesmanship, and they say they're announcing that they're rejecting the Western or now the Eastern, the Chinese notion, whatever, of pushing for GDP growth, rather they want to keep their resources intact. Their goal in the long term is a steady state economy in balance with nature. What tremendously powerful diplomatic leadership yeah. that is. Yeah, I could shame some of the richer countries into doing something. 